Hello, everyone. This is Belinda Carr, and you're listening to my podcast on building products and technology. As we know, the construction industry is ripe for automation and disruption. It has been reliant on manual labor and outdated tech for far too long, which has led to lagging productivity. Every week, I chat with a company that is exploring ways to tackle these issues. Today, I'm speaking with Louise Stewart, founder and CEO of Project Pay in the United Kingdom. Thanks for joining us, Louise. Hi, Belinda. So your company, Project Pay, is a global payment platform for the building and construction industry. You have identified and even experienced broken payment systems and the abuse of small businesses in the construction industry. And instead of just sitting back and complaining about them, you have created a solution, which is very inspirational to people all around the world. And But before we dive into the specifics of Project Pay, I'd like to talk about you and your background. You currently live in the UK right now, but you're originally from Australia. Yes, I am. So I initially encountered this problem in Australia, and it was through personal experience. I had had a previous technology business, which I had sold, and uh, was at this point actually, you know, planning to uh, to probably just retire and, and not do much, just enjoy my children growing up. And uh, my husband ran a subcontracting business, and he worked for a number of large main contractors and he was having a lot of trouble. And so he asked for my help and he said, could you, can you come in and have a look at my business? And I thought, oh, well, I don't really know much about construction, but I'd had a lot of experience working for global technology companies. And my previous startup was actually uh, connecting a fragmented marketplace. So I thought, okay, well, I'll go in and see what I can do to assist. And, uh, very quickly identified that there is absolutely a a broken payment process in the construction industry. And that is really driven by the fact that it is disconnected and none of these processes are digitized. They're all very, very manual uh, and they're all Excel based. So, uh, So really that sort of fired my passion to develop a solution to solve this problem. So you talked about being in a a different industry but prior to building Project B, and that was the healthcare industry. So was there, you said there was a lot of experience you gained in the healthcare industry. Was that industry broken as well? Yeah, so with the healthcare sector, typically you have a number of small businesses, healthcare practitioners, and uh, it's a very fragmented industry for a consumer. So, you know, for a consumer that is looking for a healthcare provider, uh, it's kind of, it's, they all operate very independently and they're not pulled together in any sort of cohesive way. So that, uh, that business was building a platform that really uh, joined a number of all the practitioners that, that provide particular services. So initially it started as an online directory And then it evolved into uh, signing contracts with all the major pharmacy groups in Australia to actually deliver a uh, look for your closest service and book in for flu vaccinations. So introduce the concept of flu vaccinations in pharmacies in Australia. Uh, Obviously sold that business before COVID hit. Uh, So (laughs) it was was a big business by the time I sold it, but given what happened with COVID, uh, you know, obviously the application is even bigger. That's true. Yeah, maybe you should have held on to that business for just for another year or so. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's typical of what you find is um, I really sort of found a very good market fit. And what I was finding is that there were a lot of competitors that were copying the business and entering into the market. So, uh, so I guess this time around, I'm very aware of what happens when you get that market fit and you create something very innovative and new that you then sort of attract a lot of copycats. So it's very important to obviously protect uh, any innovation or, uh, you know, new technology that's been developed. So when you, obviously, like you said, you you and your family went through something very personal, which started off, which triggered this mission to research as much as you can about the broken payment system and try to come up with a solution. What was that research process like? Because it wasn't exclusive to Australia or to the UK. You took it on as a global solution. Yes, well, that's right. Look, a couple of things happened. I initially built a platform for my husband to use in his business. Uh, So it really was about a ground up and, you know, providing a solution that worked for small business subcontractors because they are underserviced. You'll find that pretty much all of the technology in the construction sector is targeted at the top 2%, the large main contractors and they've actually there's not really uh, affordable technology solutions for the 98% which is small small business subcontractors 
But through the work I did there, I got invited to become the chair of an Australian Subcontractors Association and started working with governments in Australia because it was really identified that this was an urgent problem that needed to be fixed, obviously has an impact on the economy, construction is a very large industry sector. And through assisting governments was involved in a number of reports in terms of recommendations of how to fix this problem, which exposed me to uh, actually looking at, you know, every jurisdiction, uh, Canada, the USA, the UK, in terms of what was happening and what sort of actions governments were doing to actually right this wrong of subcontractors not getting paid. Uh, and, and that's where I identified that this really was a global problem. And despite how much governments might legislate to fix this problem, without a digital connected solution, it was very hard to enforce legislation. So through your research, and this data is on your website, projectpay.com, um, you say that 10,000 businesses fail every year because of this broken payment system. That's, that's enormous. How have people not come up with a solution to this problem before? I think the reason is the construction industry is incredibly complex and uh, it's, uh, it's very specialised. So, you know, within construction, there is a unique requesting for payment, payment application and certification process. And it's, it's different depending on at what level you operate within the sector. So obviously it's a different experience with your, if you're a subcontractor, if you're a trade subcontractor or a supplier, it's a different experience if you're a main contractor, and then it's a different experience if you're a project donor. Uh, so we built a platform that has taken all of that into account uh, to make sure that we are providing the benefits and, uh, you know, and, and value across all of those various parties in terms of a payment platform. Um, and the other really important factor is that, uh, you know, any solution you have to take in the whole, the multi-party aspects of construction, and that is that, you know, there is a requirement for project owners to pay a main contractor, and then the main contractor is supposed to pass on those payments to subcontractors, and then subcontractors are meant to pass on those payments to their sub-subcontractors, but there is no transparency in terms of where any of this, these funds have gone. So uh, there, you know, there is legislation um, in Canada and parts of America that do enforce sort of a statutory requirement for these payments to be passed on, but again, unfortunately, without sort of a digital solution that actually ensures this is happening, uh, it only becomes apparent once, you know, the main contractor has collapsed that, that this has not happened and those funds have then evaporated. Uh, so so, to, so yeah. to people who haven't heard about this problem before, who haven't experienced it, is there one particular example that you can provide that shows how subcontractors failed, were failed because of this broken system? Oh, look, there's so many examples. I mean, you just look at any large building company that may have collapsed recently and, uh, you know, you open the paper and you'll read that there'll be millions of dollars out of pocket because what happens, what's happened is that, uh, you know, the project donor has paid the main contractor um, and typically, you know, we're talking many millions of dollars and so then they have not, the business has collapsed uh, before they've actually passed on those payments to subcontractors or they've used those payments that were intended for subcontractors for the work that the subcontractors have done for to something, pay for something yes. else. Well, and, you know, the most awful stories you hear is that, you know, that, uh, that the money's actually been used to go and buy a Porsche or a boat or some sort of luxury item. So, and, you know, these Ponzi payment sort of schemes in the construction industry, because that is that is what it is. It is kind of using money that is intended to pay subcontractors for another purpose. Uh, and, and that is that's criminal. Yeah. So um, so it is behavior that absolutely needs to be addressed. But to address it, you have to go to the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is that there's a working capital gap in the sector. So what that does is that causes this payment dysfunction because so most countries- Could you explain countries, that again? A working capital gap. I thought it was yes. lack of transparency, but what do you mean by that? Well, lack of transparency is how, you know, the parties get away with sort of these Ponzi payment arrangements. But the root of the issue of why they behave this way is that there's this working capital gap. So most countries around the world have outlawed uh, paid when paid provisions. So 
the, the builder as the main contractor has an obligation to pay their subcontractors even if they have not yet been paid by the project owner. Um, so a builder can't say to their, their subby, I can't pay you because I haven't been paid yet. That is outlawed. Uh, but the issue is, well, then where does that capital come from for the builder to pay their subcontractors? Because of this insolvency risk in the sector, uh, none of the banks want to finance. So getting access to affordable working capital in the industry is a problem. So to fix that, you have to first address the insolvency payment risk issue um, and we do this on project pay uh, to then be able to facilitate that working capital and then provide the transparency in the ledgers to make sure that those payments are flowing in the way that they're meant to. That makes sense. Okay, so so that's how project. Can we dive into the specifics of project pay? How does it work, and how does it solve the problem that you've explained so beautifully? Like, do y'all reserve all the funds with a particular bank and make sure that? you make sure that subs are being paid during the construction? So we have integrations with a number of banks. And so the banks globally. provide us globally. Yes. Oh. So not, not in the USA yet. Uh, we plan to launch in the USA early next year. But certainly in Australia and the UK, um, we have those integrations are in place with, with um, just sort of top tier banks. So uh, they provide us with digital wallets. And that allows um, project funds to get ring fenced. And in fact, in Australia, there are new laws coming into effect that any project, private or public, um, has to be paid out of a, a digital wallet or a separate account. Uh, so, so effectively, um, the, the, these are also can be known as project bank accounts. But what project pay does is it overcomes the barriers to use these project bank accounts or what we call these digital wallets. Uh, we provide a digital solution. So it's very easy to onboard all the parties through the contract creation process. Um, and then it's very easy for the parties to actually make the request for the payments. So we actually capture all the data as it relates to the contract and the payment application process. And then the certification process, and we actually then embed that into the payment settlement through the use of digital wallets. So it's an end-to-end -end payment platform. Um, and I mean, the great thing about it is that it's very simple to use. It's very simple for the users to be onboarded and it's actually free. So, which is the other big problem is that any sort of technology platforms in the sector, as I said, are built for those big top tier contractors and they're expensive. Uh, they're not built for um, smaller businesses, where our platform really is across the board and uh, with the whole idea of making it accessible because our mission is to solve this payment problem and to be the payment platform for the construction sector. So I was going through your website before we chatted and I think y'all have a small 5% commission or something. That's how y'all are able to provide this software for free. Well, so we take a percentage fee um, and then we also, uh, if our users have registered for immediate payments, uh, then they pay a higher percentage merchant fee for those immediate payments. Uh, so how are you able to ensure that a contractor doesn't use those payments for a Porsche or a boat or other luxury items? Because the payments, the project payments never hit the contractor's bank account until their share of the payment is certified on the platform. So our ledgers um, obviously provide all the data so we know the status of where that's at at any point in time to be able to uh, allow the project wallet to be funded with the payment, whether that's from the project owner or through project pay payments where we provide the funding. Um, and we make sure that projects are actually qualified as well. So again, we, for project pay payments, we make sure that the project owner does have the means to pay for the project. It's quite shocking to me that I think the, the statistic is that sort of uh, two in five builders, this does change depending on what jurisdiction, um, only two in five builders actually qualify project owners have the money to pay for the project. That's, that's really quite shocking. So actually, that's not shocking to me because I did work on a huge project here in um, Dallas where the, the, the owner was actually trying to acquire funding 50% into the project. We weren't even oh sure goodness. if we were going to be paid or not. And then three quarters of the company was let go because they, it was in the middle of the pandemic and the owner was not able to acquire funding. 
So no, that statistic is actually not surprising to me. Well, and those those contractors and those subcontractors, they have already done work. They are floating yes. that project because they have paid their employees and so they have paid their taxes. And so how do they get paid? Yeah. So this qualification step is critical. Um, it's a very simple process on our platform. What we find is particularly at the smaller range of project, if it's a, if it's a home build, for example, Typically, homeowners have already got bank approved finance. Uh, so on that basis, obviously, the, you know, the, the onboarding of the project and the contractors is a very sort of straight through process in terms of getting the payment process happening on project pay. But yet yeah, fundamentally important because if the money is not there at the start, yeah. Uh, how does anyone get paid? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So in the beginning of the podcast, you talked about insolvency concerns, how banks and insurance companies want to stay away from the construction industry because of the risk involved. So you think that Project Pay can reduce the risk drastically because you are making sure that the owner and the, the builder has the funds before the project even starts? No, that's that's actually us um, removing the risk of if we are providing the funds for payments. So we are making sure that the project owner then has the funds okay. to refund to pay project pay at sort of 30 days 60 days whatever terms we've agreed with the project donor but what that means is that everyone in the supply chain can still get paid very very quickly um, so in terms of the insolvency risk we remove that completely because we ring fence the funds in our digital wallets so if a main contractor was to collapse uh they actually have no uh, right to access any of those project funds that have been held in the digital wallet, only obviously their, their portion of the payment. So, and that is actually one of the biggest problems that the industry has is this very, very high insolvency risk because the last thing any project owner wants to be part of or any subcontractor is working on a project where the main contractor collapses and then it becomes clear afterwards that they've not been passing on payments and then everyone is left out of pocket. So we remove that risk completely with our, uh, with our structure. So the way you describe Project Pay, I see quite a few parallels to blockchain in the construction industry. I made a video on that a couple of months ago and the transparency and the digital payments, the digital thumbprint, all that stuff. There are a couple of parallels. Have you considered adopting that technology or maybe that that's not right now maybe a couple of years down the line you might yes well, look, we've actually built the platform um, to be able to move it onto oh. the blockchain at some stage so absolutely uh, we are um, we are preparing probably in the near future to move on to um, smart contracts distributed ledgers um, and also uh, using sort of the payment settlement features that we can access on blockchain which will allow us to provide uh, construction payments to be made in a digital currency in the future as well, which we're very excited about. Uh, so I think we're still a little ways off, but certainly uh, we we know that we are heading in that direction. That's awesome that you've had that foresight to see that because we don't, obviously blockchain is going through a difficult time right now, but it I think it still has a lot of potential, has a lot of applications in the construction industry. And it's awesome that you have accounted for that while building Project Pay. So. You talked about the Australian government requiring um, like a digital form of currency, a digital form of payment in the near future. Did you work with the government to make that, to pass that law? Yes, so absolutely. So uh, Australia is governed by probably very, actually it is very similar to the USA. Um, so each state and territory has their own government. And unfortunately, there are different laws in every state and territory. The same for construction in the USA. Uh, so yes, I've worked with a number of the governments in terms of uh, reforming the payment legislation. They call it the Security of Payment Act over there. And uh, so those reforms have been actually enshrined in law now, which is why in Queensland uh, in particular, they are moving to requiring all payments to come out of a separate bank account on projects over a million dollars um, from early next year. And they've recognised that they can't deliver that without a digital solution. Yeah. Um, the Western Australian government is also just implemented new legislation and uh, New South Wales and a number of other territories are not far behind. Uh, so in Canada and the USA, you have some really interesting legislation over there where you do have the requirement for um, statutory trusts um, in Canada in particular and parts um, of the USA. Uh, the problem that the government has experienced over there is that 
even though there is an obligation that, you know, when a, a, a legislative um, sort of trust obligation imposed on the funds so that when a main contractor receives the money, that they, they should be passing on the payment. And I think there are criminal offences that apply if they don't. Uh, they can't enforce it because without a digital solution, you don't realise, you, you can't uncover that that's what's happened until, you know, there's a collapse and by then the money's gone. Yeah. So it, it really does um, provide evidence that uh, despite the good intentions of governments, you really can't change this, this pattern, this poor pattern of payments in the sector unless you have a digital solution. And in fact, I know that the Canadian government were looking at potentially using project bank accounts as well as um, statutory trusts to be able to enforce, but that just did that just you know implements a whole another level of complexity, and you really have to be very careful about how far you go with red legislation because it just becomes rigid, and then prevents the whole industry from being able to operate effectively or in compliance. That's true. That's very true. How has the construction industry received? project they have I assume that subcontractors are probably really excited about it because it protects them but have clients been a little more hesitant so effectively it's a new payment mechanism so it is a change it is a departure the important thing to know though is that project pay does not impact on the contractual relationship between the parties at all so contracts remain the same it's just a different payment mechanism so all the parties still have the same responsibilities to deliver what they've agreed in the contract. Um, so it, it's really, it's a bit of an education at the moment. So uh, it, there's huge benefits for everyone. The biggest resistance um, is not necessarily to project bank, but to project bank accounts has been from main contractors because from their point of view, they say, well, it ties up our working capital because yes. they're used to this arrangement where they can collect all the money they act like a mini bank and they can collect all the money and then effectively spend it as um, they see fit yes uh, they can spend it as they see fit without any transparency so have you funded any projects in australia and the uk already using project pay yeah so we've we've had a number of projects we've had only over 20 million dollars worth of projects um in australia that have used project pay um, and we're still fairly early on in terms of our rollout in Australia, but we, we have um, a number of projects that we are working with in terms of uh, delivering solutions to so housing associations over here who are the biggest developers. Um, there is absolutely a construction playbook that's been put out by the UK government to uh, make sure that, uh, you know, small businesses on housing association projects have payment certainty and that their, you know, supply chains are being paid. Uh, and we've been extensively funded by um, the UK government through the innovation program. So yes, so congratulations for getting that. Thank you. Yes. So um, so absolutely, there the the UK government is very committed to see this problem solved, as are all the governments around the world, because this is a huge economic issue. Uh, and um, yeah, we're, look, we're really excited to sort of um, we've sort of delivered the the platform on a number of smaller projects, but we're really excited to. Uh, get going on some of these bigger projects that we've now been working on. And you said you all are planning on expanding to the States pretty soon next year? Yes, so we're currently undergoing some customization, but the um, the payment process in the UK and the United States is very similar. So we're just doing some um, some customization for the US market and uh, and then we are planning to be in market early next year. We do feel that the uh, legislative environment in the United States lends very well to the platform and what we have to offer, because what we have seen is the other unfortunate thing about legislation, which has the right intentions, is it can also change behaviours in a negative way. So uh, you have this great mechanism in the USA where uh, if a subcontractor has not been paid, they can put a lien on the project owner's property. But what we're seeing, this is encouraging project owners to delay payments because that lien can only be placed up to 45 days. So then project owners just delay payment even further. So then they no longer have that responsibility of whether the main contractor has passed on the payment or not. So that's that needs to be fixed. That's not right. That's not legislation working the way that it should be working. And you don't see that happening in the UK? 
No, well, UK, UK and Australia don't have the same lien rights that you have in the USA. So I guess you have a very supportive uh, legal structure there for project pay. And, uh, and what we can do is we can provide those project donors with the transparency to see that those payments will flow through. So there's no reason to delay. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, you're truly an inspiration, not just to women. Obviously, you are. But to everyone in the industry, I mean, you identified a problem and you didn't just sit back and say, well, it happens to 1% of us. It's okay. Let's just move on. You tackled it head on. You did so much research and you, you, you're you trying to fix such a huge problem that's going to benefit so many people. And it's very inspirational. Congrats. Oh, thanks very much, Belinda. Well, look, it's just, it's just a problem that's long overdue for a solution. Yeah. As you said at the start, I do not understand. I mean, I do understand because it's very complex, but it really is um, something that is long overdue to be solved. And it's it just allows these small businesses to actually operate how they're meant to operate. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could end with some advice to people who look up to you. At the beginning of the podcast, you said there are a lot of, when you build something so innovative and something that has the potential to change the industry for the better, there are a lot of copycats that are going to pop up when they see what you have achieved. How can How are you protecting your business? How do you recommend uh like what steps should people take to protect their like intellectual property yeah look it's a it's a good question um i think the i think the important thing for me at least has been that i always build proprietary technology and i have my you know internal development team so that obviously gives you a greater control over managing your IP and your intellectual property rights as well, that it, it is actually proprietary and it's built in-house. Uh, but I think the other important things to consider is we've actually just registered a patent on our cascading um, payment structure that we've invented, um, a global patent. So, you know, it's um, even though it can seem like it's a bit of work, I think it is worth sort of taking those extra steps to protect you know uh, all your efforts and your investment into inventions and um but i think that just um just actually being sort of the culture of the company as well and how the company's led so we just sort of we never sit back and think okay well we've done that we're always looking for the next thing so as i mentioned you know when we built the business we realized that you know there's going to be some blockchain um, opportunities here in the future so we really built it with that in mind and just to make sure that you're always one step ahead because yes. the copycats they'll always copy you but they're not obviously coming up with the ideas themselves, so they'll never catch you if you keep moving forward. That's excellent advice. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that with us, Louise. And um, I'll def what's the best way for people to learn more about Project Pay if they're interested in using your platform? Um, look, so they can have a look at our website. Um, so it's projectpay.com.au or projectpay.co.uk. Uh, or they can reach out and uh, send me an email. It's lstuart at projectpay.co.uk uh, or LinkedIn. They can find me on LinkedIn. So very happy to chat to anyone in the industry that might want to learn more. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing Project Pay being implemented in the States. And maybe we can come back once we, we can have another podcast once you uh, once people in the States adopt it and you you can like tweak the, the business or something and share lessons learned. That would be great. Look, and I'm due a trip to Dallas. So uh, when I'm oh. there, well, uh, I'll let you know when we can catch up for coffee. That's wonderful. Thanks again, Louise. Thanks, Belinda. Enjoy the rest of your day. See you later.